and then we'll keep going. All right, I'm going to pass to Shale Wong. She's going to do some introductions of speakers and really get us um, dive, diving into the content for, for the day. Hello, everyone. This is Shale Wong. I am the director of the Farley Health Policy Center, and we are really pleased that you have found some time, hopefully over your lunch hour, that you can relax for a few minutes and, uh, and join us for this webinar and thinking about how we can continue uh, to evolve and grow our work in integrated behavioral health and primary care across the state. Um, We're excited to dig in. Um, it is not just myself, but we'll be hearing from others uh, from the SIM office and from other partners today. So let me just tell you a little bit about um, the Farley Center very briefly, and then I will turn it over to our other speakers to introduce themselves as well. Um, like we said, my name is Shale. I am a general pediatrician um, by training and uh, have been with the Farley Health Policy Center for almost five years now. We are positioned here at the University of Colorado on the Anschutz Medical Campus um, and really uh, are poised here to leverage the health sciences research both to inform and study policy. Um, our mission is to overcome the fragmented healthcare delivery system with policy and structural system changes to address the whole person, integrating behavioral health, physical health, social health. Um, this project has been particularly exciting for us. We are thrilled to be digging in today as an opportunity to support the state efforts and draw upon multiple sectors to come together to meet behavioral health needs of Coloradans. Our partners, um, in this work and in this effort, bring expertise in content, in the full context of how this work has been done so far, in science and communications um, together to shape our proposal and activities. So I'm going to turn this first to Heather um, so that you can introduce yourself and your role. Um, and then um, if you flip it back to me, I will continue with introductions. So Heather. Hi, this is Heather Grimshaw. I'm the Director of Communications and Strategic Partnerships for the Colorado State Innovation Model. And I'm Laurel Broughton, the Data Strategy Coordinator with SIM, and I'll be work leading this for the SIM office. Fantastic. Um, thank you, guys. And Victoria? Hi, this is Victoria Scott. Um, so I am a uh, faculty member at UNC Charlotte um, and lead the readiness component of our work together. Um, and I'm here with members of the Carolina Readiness team. That is uh, Leslie and Tara. That's fantastic. And back to you, Shale. Thanks, Victoria. There are, um, there are too many to name. Although we're a small team, I'm not gonna try to name all of the folks from the Farley Center who are gonna be involved in this project. But let it suffice to say that um, our team is comprised of specialists in primary care, public health, behavioral health, law, and policy. And we will try to draw upon the expertise from all those folks to help inform this effort. So for the next hour, let me just give you a brief idea of what we're going to try to cover. And we actually have plenty of time um, for interaction and discussion. So please, as you're hearing some of this information, keep your questions in mind and we will absolutely open up uh, the mic to others. Um, but our agenda, as it's laid out, is that Heather will begin by providing an overview of Colorado SIM. And we recognize that we have a mix of participants, some who have been deeply involved in the SIM activities over the course of the last several years, and some less directly involved. So we think that starting with the SIM overview is important. Um, I will do a little bit of an overview on the readiness assessment and our approach to collecting stakeholder input from across the state. And then we'll have our Carolina readiness team offer a primer on readiness and the science of understanding complex systemic engagement. And then we'll let you know the timeline for how these activities are gonna play out and wrap up um, by responding to any final questions that folks may have. So with that, I think we can jump in. Heather, we're going to start with you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd just like to say that the SIM office is really excited about this project and looking forward to working with the, the Farley Center on this. So I'm going to work, I'm going to move through these slides pretty quickly um, here and, and appreciate the opportunity to give an overview of SIM, uh, the Colorado State Innovation Model. So I think we can go to the next slide. So just quickly, I won't read through everything here, but SIM is a federally funded governor's office initiative that is helping healthcare providers in Colorado integrate behavioral and physical health in primary care settings and to learn how to succeed with alternative payment models. The Colorado team has been funded by up to $65 million from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to implement and test its healthcare reform proposal. Our goal, which is rather lofty, is to improve the health of Coloradans by increasing access to integrated care in coordinated community systems with value-based payment structures for 80% of state residents by the time we end, which is in July 2019. And we're happy to uh, note that we are working with 25% of the state's primary care practice sites and four of our community mental health centers. Um, and we have an interactive map. We've got a, a link to our data hub. We have some very exciting data that shows that our, our approach to healthcare reform is working. So I hope that you all will take the time to go to our data hub and, and look at some of the information that our data team is producing. Laurel is part of our wonderful data team and will jump in here as, um, as she can to help me with this. So I think we're ready for the next slide. So in Colorado, we took a four pillar approach to reaching our goal of, of increasing access to integrated care for 80% of Coloradans. Uh, and you'll see there's payment reform, practice transformation, population health, and health information technology. We recognize the fact that in order to really increase access to this type of care and sustain that access, we really had to take a comprehensive or holistic approach to healthcare reform, which as I mentioned earlier, we're pleased to see has taken root and is really producing some exciting results. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot. We like to call this uh, piece of collateral our place map and we have this on our website. Uh, this provides really a nice visual of the ways in which that four pillar approach has influenced care across the state. So in addition to our primary care practice sites, you see our community mental health centers here. We've also invested in local public health agencies and behavioral health tech, uh, transformation collaboratives that are touching 31 counties. Um, we also have six health plans that are working together, and this, what we call our multi-payer collaborative, it's actually not our multi-payer collaborative, but it is a multi-payer collaborative, is very important to uh, supporting this type of work across the state and really sustaining this type of care across the state. Um, we've also helped to fund a regional health connector. This is a new workforce in Colorado that is, is helping connect providers to community resources to expand access to care and also to avoid duplication. Um, and one of the things that we really like to highlight is the fact that theory is always different than implementation and we're really pleased to have providers who are telling us that they recognize that integrated care is the linchpin to improving care. So you see a, a quote here from one of our pediatricians who, I, who was in cohort one. I think we're ready for the next slide. And before I go on to the next slide, I'm just getting a, um, I just got a text message about some potential um, background noise. So if I can just remind people to please mute phones and computers. So in Colorado, we, we selected uh, integrated behavioral and physical health as our main approach to achieving healthcare reform or to helping uh, practices succeed with alternative payment models. And so we've, we've included a slide here that shows the cost of untreated behavioral health, which we have the, the really high dollar figures there, the number of visits to, uh, visits to physician offices with mental disorders um, listed here, as well as emergency department visits. And, and what isn't listed here is the cost associated with um, that care to people and families and communities which is something that we appreciate very much. So I think that uh, one of the things that we've tried to do with them is as we're implementing the model, highlighting the stories from communities, from providers, as well as patients, 
So we have some stories on our website that we hope you'll take some time to read through. Um, but this kind of illustrates the reason, reason why we, we selected integrated care. Next slide. So one of the reasons that, that the Colorado team has been as successful as it has been is because of our stakeholders. Uh, the SIM team has worked with six work groups that are listed here uh, to ensure that, that we really have stakeholders at the table who are guiding our work and helping us course correct as appropriate. Uh, so we have all of the work groups listed here. We also have a, a link to the, the work groups as well as our calendar. These meetings are open to the public and we, we strongly encourage everyone and anyone to attend. Uh, we also have meeting minutes uh, posted, so uh, really encourage participation. And this slide really helps us illustrate the value, excuse me, of this work with the Farley Center. I think that recognizing that we have about five months left with SIM, we're really counting on stakeholders to help us continue this work. Next slide, please. And I think this is my last slide. This is really our proof of concept. So I mentioned earlier, we have information listed on our data hub. And we're so pleased to work with our data team to really showcase how this, this integrated care results in better patient outcomes. And also uh, care teams that tell us this, that, that say this is the right way to deliver care and they see the benefits with patients. So recognizing that now almost 81% of children ages one through three are being screened for developmental, behavioral, and social delays and SIM practices, um, as well as some of our other data points here, it's, it's very exciting for us to see how this hard work at a practice level and the community mental health center level, uh, local public health level, as well as payment reform and HIT is really resulting in, those, in that better care. So we are continuing to work at this and all moving into our sustainability mode, which is why we're so looking forward to this work. Yeah, and I just wanted to highlight again what Heather said about stakeholders being so vital to the implementation of SIM and that we only have the five months left. So we're really relying on our partners to continue the work of behavioral health going forward. We're excited to be partnering with the Farley Center and the Carolina Readiness Team to be able to measure your readiness to continue the partnerships you've created to integrate behavioral health. So back to Shale. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, so at, at this stage, uh, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about how we got into um, this opportunity and it, with the work that we're gonna do. So, you know, we can now have a, a little better understanding of really the vast undertaking of SIM. Um, I think it's clear that recognizing the complexity of behavioral health integration and all of the levels at which um, this is, has been started, um, it would be kind of a little crazy to think that behavioral health integration is complete um, and the work is done. Uh, nobody really feels that way, and yet everybody's now really thinking about, okay, what do we do to ensure that this can successfully uh, continue, um, not even just sustain at the level where we are, but continue to evolve. And so with this, we consider some basic working assumptions that behavioral health integration is a complex social endeavor, that it's gonna require continued multi-sectoral engagement and investment of resources. And when I say resources, I'm not thinking just the dollars that need to go into this, but you know, it's financial resources, it's intellectual, resources, um, there is uh, continued energy that is gonna really have to be input to continually build the relationships and evolve the work. To help ensure effective next steps, uh, we'd like to deeply understand what you as stakeholders feel ready and empowered to do. Understanding readiness to lead, sustain and advance efforts will facilitate the steps towards system change and policy development that really has to be in place for continued progress. So with this investigation, our hope is to assess and better understand the motivation and the capacity of you all as stakeholders across the state to continue to collaborate, sustain, and advance upon the gains that SIM has made. 
beyond completion of the currently funded implementation period, since that is rounding out in July of 2019. So the Farley Center has been contracted by the SIM office to assess stakeholder readiness, to maintain collaborative partnerships as the SIM effort um, formally is winding down. So we have two objectives uh, in, in this work to keep it simple. Our first is to assess readiness, and our second is to share those findings of what we learn back with you, offering recommendations to the governor's office and offering steps toward a path forward for stakeholders, um, really tapping into your unique level of engagement and responsibility. Our team at the Farley Center has been involved in several other states over the past several years, exploring opportunities for state level policy change to improve delivery of integrated behavioral health care. While each state is different in their needs and capacity, some principles really remain consistent. And those states who are listening to their stakeholders and are engaging in systematic exchange of information about what works and what doesn't um, is really what accelerates the progress. So this assessment of readiness is our opportunity to understand where you are right now in the phase of this work and what you're excited to keep doing. What do you want and need to ensure that you can continue? And what needs to change for you to be able to fully engage and lead new efforts or initiatives? So understanding readiness isn't solely about team building or workflow or payment to support this. It may be inclusive of those things, but it's a, a little different approach that will support your capacity and begin to address your needs in hopes of targeting future plans for resources. So this is our plan. Um, we have been fortunate enough to engage um, some outstanding partners to really study the science of readiness and the art of dissemination to help in this work. The Carolina Readiness Team, who you're gonna hear from in just a moment, based in both North and South Carolina, have worked with us to develop the assessment tool that will be used and will continue to help with, our, with the analyses. And then we're also engaging Vermilion Design. They are a digital marketing team based in Boulder, but with extensive national reach. We've had the pleasure of working with them in the past on developing engaging both live and animated video messaging, as well as other web-based products that help make complex information around behavioral health and integration more accessible and enjoyable. So as stated, we're gonna produce a comprehensive report of the findings from the readiness assessment for the SIM office, as well as additional products for you to use. Um, and we'll explore with you how to best deliver that information to you and your constituents, whether it's in a video or a podcast, whether it's in short focused summaries or face-to-face -face convenings. We wanna really tap into what's gonna resonate and how we're gonna best reach folks across the state. The point is really to find a unifying message and a strategy that will allow continued sharing of information. So there's an implementation of a web-based tool um, that will assess the readiness across sectors. As I said, the report to the governor's office um, that describes the degree of readiness and then these other uh, products that will be disseminated more broadly. Um, as we finish this, after uh, the Victoria and her team have an opportunity to share a little bit more about readiness itself. Um, I'll go into more of a timeline on how we expect um, those different pieces to be implemented. But I'm going to pause here for a moment and see if there are questions with respect to uh, the Farley Center's um, approach for this work. And since I have over and over again requested muting, just make sure if you're trying to ask a question that you unmute your the line on Zoom or star six on your phone, or you can chat into the chat box. With that pause, I'm going to just use it as a prompt to say, keep thinking about questions if anything else arises. Um, but let's get into readiness itself. Victoria, it's all you. Yes, thanks, Shale. And then Tara, I'm going to pass it to you to kick it off. Great. So I'm Tara Kenworthy. I am 
a member of the Carolinas Readiness Team. Um, the reason we call ourselves that is because we're located um, both at the University of South Carolina and the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, and our team brings expertise in organizational readiness. Um, we're also affiliated with the Wandersman Center, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, and we've been working collaboratively with the Farley Health Policy Team here, uh, listed here, to adapt our readiness work for the context of cross-sector partnerships and the work that you all have been doing with SIM. Um, so my colleagues, Victoria and Leslie, and I are excited to have the opportunity to talk to you today about readiness and how it applies to the work that you all do. Um, and we're going to kind of switch off as we go along, so you'll hear the other presenters um, as we go. Go to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, we're affiliated with the Wandersman Center. Um, this is an interdisciplinary team that has extensive experience in community psychology, program evaluation, quality improvement, and implementation science. Um, we work to rigorously apply these skills and knowledge in real-world settings to achieve the maximum benefit for organizational and community-level practitioners. Um, and specifically in the context of this work, um, our team has developed um, a concept for or a model for organizational readiness called R equals MC squared that we'll be reviewing today. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and right, our readiness work, this R equals MC squared model, has been applied to many settings, um, including those listed here. So it's a flexible model that can be customized for any context. Um, and as we move through this presentation, we'll consider how it's applied to the context of STEM. Next slide. Did it move to the next slide? Sorry, I, I'm not seeing it. Okay, there we go. You good? Um, so, yeah, my, I think my internet connection might be a little bit slow, so please let me know if I'm not catching up with something. Um, so just to overview, we're going to introduce readiness, so the R equals MC squared model, um, and then talk about how we've applied it in the context of this. Next. Are we on to the next, the lobster slide? We are on the lobster slide. Thank you. I'm sorry. I've definitely got a delay going here. That's okay. This is um, Thanks. So um, we think of readiness a lot like cooking. And this is just a really basic example to get you guys primed and thinking about what readiness means. Um, and hopefully it kind of speaks to everybody in some way, whether you like lobster or not. So um, let's say your partner says he wants lobster for dinner. You really want to make your partner happy, so you're willing to make lobster, but it's Monday and payday isn't until Friday, and you realize that lobster is really expensive. And you're a vegetarian and you haven't cooked seafood in years. So you're motivated, you really want to make your partner happy, you want to make that lobster, but you don't have the capacity to buy lobster today, you haven't got the money. Um, and you don't have the capacity to cook seafood at all um, as a vegetarian, you have no skills in that area. So right now, you're not ready to cook that lobster dinner. Maybe with some cooking classes and your paycheck, you can make this happen, um, but the outcome would not be what your partner is hoping for tonight. So that'll transition over to Victoria in thinking about these different components of readiness. Thanks, Tara. Next slide. So what is readiness? Uh, readiness is the extent to which an entity, uh, such as an organization, is both willing uh, and able to implement an innovation, with an innovation being a program, a policy, a practice um, that is new or a new focus to a particular setting. So in this case, when we're talking about the innovation, we're um, talking specifically about engaging in cross-sector, multi-sector partnerships to advance and sustain statewide integrated behavioral health. Next slide. In 2015, our team published an article that identified elements critical for organizations to be able to implement a, uh, something new. And so these elements are captured in an evidence-based uh, heuristic referred to as R equals MC squared. And uh, for those who are uh, wondering, um, yes, the, the name is inspired by the very brilliant uh, Albert Einstein. 
And so in the next few slides, we delve into the nuts and bolts of readiness. Um, in other words, what are the organizational features that make up readiness? Next slide. So R equals MC squared is the readiness framework that captures critical elements for quality implementation. These elements are categorized into three components. Um, motivation, uh, which is the willingness or desire of individuals in an organization to change or adapt um, in, in innovation. Innovation-specific capacity, which refers to the specific conditions and supports needed to effectively implement a, a particular program or practice. And general capacity, which pertains to the aspects of an organization's functions, such as its culture, climate, staff capacity, and leadership. <clears throat> uh, and Stephanie, can you click one more time for the three-legged stool? Thank you. So we find it helpful to think of uh, readiness as a three-legged stool. Um, so if any leg is missing, um, the, uh, the stool won't stand up. Similarly, if an organization has capacities but not motivation, the organization uh, will not be fully ready to implement a new innovation. Next slide. So each of these readiness components is made up of a, a set of subcomponents, uh, which are listed here. And all these subcomponents come from an extensive literature review of elements that are critical for quality implementation. Uh, so I'll begin with the original subcomponents and then come back to those uh, with the asterisks. Within motivation, relative advantage assesses whether an innovation is better than what is being done within an organization to assess a particular uh, need. Compatibility is how well the innovation fits with your organization. Simplicity is the perceived ease of implementing the innovation. Observability reflects the extent to which outcomes of an innovation are readily apparent. And priority measures the extent to which stakeholders view the innovation as important for the work of the organization. Under innovation-specific capacity, uh, knowledge, skills, and ability uh, assesses, assesses the organization's level of know-how to implement the innovation. So again, here we're talking about engaging in cross-sector partnerships. Um, supportive climate pertains to the availability of resources and supports for the innovation. In organizational relationships, captures relationships with other organizations needed for implementing the innovation. And then within the general uh, capacity uh, component, um, which so again, general capacity referring to the general functioning of an organization. Um, there's culture, which refers to the behavior norms of the organization. Climate, which captures the perceptions of the work environment. Innovativeness, uh, which refers to the openness of organizational members to practice um, or to engage in new practices. Resource utilization, which pertains to having and, uh, alloc having and allocating appropriate resources. Leadership, uh, capturing the effectiveness of organizational leaders. Internal operation, uh, which refers to organizational members, um, how well they communicate and uh, work as a team. And then staff capacity, which me measures the adequacy of human capital and talent. So you'll see within each of these components, there's a series of subcomponents uh, that have asterisks. And those with asterisks are the subcomponents that have been added uh, to customize readiness to the objective of statewide behavioral uh, integration. And so these elements such as partnership value, conflict management, uh, come from the literature on cross-sector partnerships. Next slide. The R equals MC squared um, framework has been operationalized into an assessment tool for a variety of settings. Uh, so, for example, um, in our work with a national integrated care capacity building effort, R equals MC squared was operationalized to assess readiness for integrated care at a practice level. And so more about the readiness for integrated care questionnaire um, can be found in the article displayed here, uh, which was published in 2017 by Scott and colleagues. Next slide. And so when we think about readiness, um, there's a few defining uh, features that, are, um, uh, that, are, that capture how we um, conceptualize readiness. And so first is that when we hear the term readiness, we tend to think of the construct dichotomously as ready or not. Um, however, readiness is actually a continuous construct um, that ranges from higher uh, to lower levels. Uh, second is that readiness is a dynamic um, and uh, a contract that fluctuates over time. Um, so as changes occur in an organizational context, such as staff turnover, 
uh, readiness for an innovation will also change um, depending on the, the changes in the environment. And then lastly, um, well, we frequently um, assess readiness at the beginning of an initiative. Uh, readiness is not merely relevant to the early stages of an innovation. Um, and in fact, continuously measuring and monitoring readiness, um, it's important for surfacing opportunities to build organizational readiness and to increase the probability of achieving targeted outcomes. Uh, next slide. And so now I'll turn it over to uh, Leslie Snapper uh, to talk about uh, the application of um, readiness to cross-sector partnerships. And Leslie, on to you. Um, so now that we have some background on what readiness is, let's take a look at the application of readiness to cross-sector partnerships. As mentioned previously, um, I'm just going to go through them quickly. The objectives of this project include assessing readiness of stakeholders to develop and participate in cross-sector partnerships aimed at sustaining and advancing integration of behavioral health care, as well as disseminating those findings and recommendations that are gleaned from the assessment to support policy change and infrastructure at the systems level. We'll go to the next slide. Here is what we've been doing to achieve these objectives. Um, this webinar is a key step in the process to introduce readiness and prepare stakeholders for the readiness survey administration. In addition, there has been extensive work customizing the readiness tool to the context of cross-sector partnerships, particularly at the state or systems level versus a practice level. And part of this customization process included um, adding critical subcomponents, as Victoria highlighted previously, um, all of which were informed by key themes found in the literature pertaining to evaluation of partnerships. And then this third uh, bullet point here, results from the readiness survey will be organized into a report indicating the readiness of stakeholders for advancing and sustaining cross-sector partnerships as well as the, the, by identifying the strengths as well as areas for improvement. And the report will also include recommendations for the governor's office regarding ways to build readiness. Next slide. This slide shows a sample of some of the questions assessing readiness to partner across sectors. Um, as you can see with the, the green bar at the bottom, all items are responded to on a Likert scale from one to seven, with one being strongly disagree and seven being strongly agree. And Steph, if you can just um, click next, I think twice. Thank you. So as you can see here, there are specific questions to assess each subcomponent, um, such as relative advantage, which is part of mot the motivation component of readiness. And if we go to the next slide, we can see an example of how the results of these questions are displayed in a report. This is a snapshot of a sample readiness report. The scores, um, basically the average scores are taken and ranked on a heat map. So, and you can see the color coding key on the right that shows that green is relatively high readiness while red is relatively low readiness. And that heat map allows us to identify those areas of strength as well as areas for improvement. And Stephanie, again, just, um, I think it's twice. Perfect, thank you. So based on this example, the partnership value subcomponent had relatively high scores and would therefore be identified as an area of strength. And in contrast, the compatibility subcomponent scores are relatively low, indicating that that's an area for improvement. And I think, next slide. So here are just some, the references that were mentioned um, in previous slides for your, for your access, and then next slide. And this is uh, the contact information for our readiness team. And I think I'm passing it back to Shale now. All right, thank you guys. Um, there's an opportunity at this point to, again, take questions. Um, 
We anticipated that for many of you, the readiness element of this was really sort of a substance, um, the greatest substance of this webinar. We didn't want anybody to be um, invited or, or receiving uh, a survey to assess their readiness without having had some introduction of what this is and why we're doing it. Um, so I will again just pause for a moment to see if there are questions and then I can move into what we expect the timeline to be. Okay, let me, let me just let you know what, the, what our expectation is in terms of moving through this work over the next several months. Um, we've been in the planning phase uh, for some time now. Um, in developing the tool and in really understanding with the, the SIM office um, what the needs are uh, to, to address with this work. So today's our kickoff webinar um, that you can see. We have just 10 days, um, so it's a week from Monday that you should expect to receive uh, by email the readiness assessment. And we anticipate that um, moving through this readiness assessment is about 15 minutes um, to take the, take the assessment itself. So we're hoping that you all will engage in this effort because it's really your input that's critically important to informing all of this work moving forward. Um, the assessment tool will be open from the 11th to the 29th. Um, by the end of March, as we have collected this information, we will then begin the analysis of these data through the next few weeks and develop the report um, that goes back to the SIM office in May. Um, as we've mentioned, that's sort of a first phase for us. We really wanna learn from the, from the readiness as it stands. And then we also wanna take this information and figure out the best ways um, to get it back to you and, in, and to help give you the kind of information that you really can benefit from in learning what steps to take next and how to really collaborate and continue to work together. So those final products um, will be disseminated, uh, we're aiming for you know, midsummer, um, will be developed really over the course of this whole period of time, but with delivery in July. And that takes us to the end of the formal period of um, of our Colorado SIM, um, but really it's just the launching point for how the rest of us continue to drive this work moving forward. And one of the most important things that I think I hope to gain in terms of, uh, of some insight is really where the early steps are and the opportunities are um, for those agencies, entities, practices um, who are ready to kind of step up and lead. Um, there's, there's a lot to be learned from the readiness assessment with respect to leadership as well as partnership, um, and then the specific content of what to do. So that's my take on, um, on what our plan is for carrying out this work. Um, if you have additional questions and uh, want to reach out to either someone at the Farley Center or at SIM, We've given you both Stephanie and Laurel's contact information here and on the previous slide um, for questions specifically related to readiness um, back to the Carolina Readiness Team. So that gives us about 15 minutes um, before the end of the hour here that we really would be happy to address any sort of questions that folks may have. Um, and before sort of delving into the question period, let me just thank um, Heather and Laurel uh, for helping to bring the SIM information together for this work. Um, the whole Carolina Readiness team and my own team, uh, Stephanie in particular, for helping with all of the coordination to get this to, together. Um, the real thanks will come to you all as stakeholders uh, for both participating today but continuing to engage in this work. And the, the floor is open for questions.
it looks like there's a, a question that came through via Zoom, and so I appreciate that, and I'm sorry that I'm not actually seeing the screen, but it's been relayed to me that there's been a question about Vermilion Design, and who are they as, um, as a design team, and how might we see some of their work? So Vermilion um, can be found, we, we, by just Googling Vermilion Design, um, and you can see all kinds of stuff from them in terms of their work. But the work that we've done with them specifically was around was developing a communications platform called Make Health Whole. And so Make Health Whole um, is its own platform that you can see uh, some of the products developed by Vermilion in collaboration with the Farley Center that really does address specifically integrated behavioral health. Um, that's one place where you can see the um, where we've captured the behavioral health competencies that have been developed specifically for the state of Colorado for our behavioral health, licensed behavioral health workers, um, as well as uh, some of the video product that um, we've developed to help try to bring to life this issue, both for patients and for providers. So that's where I would point you to as an example, makehealthwhole.org. And we can um, ensure that as we're reaching out to you through um, next steps and further communication that you've got links to that as well. And the link is currently in the chat box. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Um, just very quickly, this is Paul Knight from Vermilion. Thanks, Shale. And if there are any questions pertaining to our work so far with uh, the Farley Center around uh, this integration work, um, feel free to contact me at paulk at vermilion.com. Thanks, Paul. I'm glad that you could join us today. All right, well, I think that um, on a Friday afternoon, it's nice to gain 14 minutes back in your day. Um, so I just want to say again, thank you all for participating in this first step as an introduction to readiness. And <clears throat> you can count on hearing from us again very soon, particularly with the actual assessment tool that will hit your email um, on March 11th. Have a great weekend. Just one other quick housekeeping tip or point. The recording will be posted on the SIM website as soon as we can get it turned around. So if you want to share this with others within your organization or if you know of people who weren't able to join us live, it'll be available on the SIM website. Perfect. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.